Well, let's uh, settle in for maybe 15 minutes of silent practice time. Join the momentum. How in moments at least there can be a very natural, even effortless present moment awareness. even some continuity naturally, uncontrived.
And for the last minute or so, just contemplating in your own experience what is worthy of trust. What is it that's here and now being known, the way the mind is relating? What of it is trustworthy? All of it, none of it, some of it? Just see how your heart responds to that inquiry. And instead of looking for an answer cognitively, what's trustworthy experientially? What way of being, what way of relating, what activity? Is related to a deep, sense of safety, trust. Feel free to take a little time to move the body, stretch a little. <coughs> Matthew, would you be willing to put the fan on low? It's uh, still on medium, I think. Actually, it could probably be shut off even now. So hopefully um, our own experience is demonstrating that what's happening is a natural process. I mean, at least intellectually, it makes sense. And uh, we want to see that conditional nature, like when we're in one of those stressful, oppressive vortexes. <coughs> of worry or planning or whatever the obsession might be. We want to see it's like an organic, in a sense, living process, somehow being fed and being fed, it then spins like this until it's not no longer being fed and then it falls apart. And it's, you know, initially we gain confidence about how everything is just conditional, everything's a natural process, looking at these mental, emotional storms, not just in meditation periods, of course, but just in daily life. And not always, of course, in the middle of it, but maybe then later when reflecting in hindsight, oh yeah, you know, that weather system blew in the mind was spun around for a while, and then it blew out. Oh, and because it, it begs the question, I wonder what weather system this is. Maybe this is also, this more calm state, let's say, is also just another natural process unfolding 
and it will change. And then, you know, with more application of mind to the present moment, this is how it is, you know, we start to see the unwholesome vortexes, but we also begin to see the wholesome vortexes, like how good begets good. Confidence begets confidence. Seeing clearly supports seeing clearly. Being kind supports being kind. There are all these other, just as many positive patterns that our life, that our mind can fall into. So we start to see the difference. You know, the Buddha describes this as like, what are we feeding and what are we starving? Are we feeding the right stuff? And something I'm sure you, most of us have heard because it's gone around and around this story and I, I won't do it justice because I don't have it written in, down in front of me, but it might have been a Cherokee elder um, told a story about, to his grandson about wolves, you know, the good wolf and the bad wolf, you know, and you can just fill in the, the story about the good one and the bad one. And uh, the grandson asks at the end, well, which one wins? And the grandfather says, well, it depends which one you feed. And it's the same thing. This is our predicament. So tonight I want to talk about one of those positive processes. And initially, you know, from a, let's call it a practitioner point of view, a personal point of view, a self-centered point of view, we're trying to get this process of awakening in motion. And I don't know if it's a good image, but the image that came to mind, I'm sure you've seen this, uh, people like who do these feats of juggling and there's also the ones you know that spin the plates you know and it's like how many plates can they get spinning and when you see the person getting it started it looks kind of clumsy you know they're kind of reaching for plates and or you know adding more balls to the juggling but then after a while it's like they get in the rhythm when they've sort of reached their apex of skill whatever that is however many plates they're spinning or balls they're juggling or you know, whatever the, even mu musical groups, you know, they, they come together in, at times where the sum is greater than the parts. Right? And it's a little bit like this engine of awakening. In Buddhism, it's called the five indriyas, the five spiritual faculties. Indriyas, some of you know that back in the day, the god Indra, probably related to Zeus, but this is like in India, northern India especially. Uh, and it was sort of the controlling God. So they, the Buddha named these mental faculties after this very popular idea of Indra, who subjugated the demons and organized the deities, you know, like Zeus, you know, organizing the other sort of whatever they were back then, you know, or whatever people thought they were. So these five faculties you're going to be very familiar with, faith, energy, which in, uh, interestingly comes from the word virya. It's like virile, I think, related because the Indo-European languages, Sanskrit and Pali, similar to a lot of the European languages. So faith or confidence, energy, sati, awareness, mindfulness, samadhi, that unification, that stability, it comes from the continuity of mindfulness, and then wisdom. And it's like this thing we got to get in motion. Wherever we start, you know, we come at it probably with whatever we're most interested in, we're more naturally skilled at, but we got to get all those plates moving. <laughs> and of course, they all affect each other. And when they all get moving, the Buddha describes them not as the five controlling factors, but the five strengths or the five powers. 
And uh, it's, it's one of the more common maps that's used, especially in modern day Theravada culture, you know, Sri Lanka, Burma, Thailand, Laos and Cambodia, and a few other places. But in that sort of Theravada world, early Buddhist world, people really like these because it's a simple map. And you know, these different maps, the Eightfold Path and <laughs> The five hindrances and the seven factors of awakening and, you know, the four powers and the four exertions and there's so many, but they're really different maps overlapping the same thing, which is just the natural activity of the heart and mind. And the Buddha taught, you know, for 45 years, different contexts, different people. So the articulation is going to be unique in that time and place because he was a compassionate and skillful teacher. So, and he didn't have notes. <laughs> so what he said was sort of contextual, like in this context, this, this is what's coming out of my mouth. And so, but the nuns and monks and lay people revered so much everything he said that after the Buddha passed away, they, you know, they kind of codified all the maps orally for many at least a few centuries before they got written down on palm leaves. And uh, all the way, there's a real conservative element in the tradition to kind of not to sort the teachings, not that it was perfect by any means, but uh, yeah, trying to remember, like there was this person who said these things, who really understood their own heart-mind process and understood it at such a depth that what they said about it transcends to a large degree culture and time. So that even now at such a different time and culture, the teachings still sort of like point to our own experience in a way that's relevant. So let's go through these five spiritual faculties. And it's, it's a real shift because when we start to think about this experience of mind and body, me, as a natural process, then, then the first thing that should come to mind is like, well, is it just sort of going to spin out in the way that it's predetermined to spin out? I mean, is there any way to affect? But remember, like, even me saying this is the natural process in any kind of reflection we do about our experience, that's also part of that natural process, right? So it's like, it's always going to be our experience, our subjective experience, not our theoretical experience, but our actual experience is the natural process. And so the way that the unfolding of the natural process is affected is by how we're relating to this present moment one moment at a time. And if we think, which we generally do, being aware of this is just not relevant because I got to earn a living. I got to figure out what I'm going to eat for dinner. You know, all these sort of details and we're just not interested. And so that negligence, that lack of interest is how we affect how the natural process unfolds. So we can't affect it, but the way we affect it is by how we understand it, how we look at it, how we open to it, how we receive it, how we respond to this. In short, you know, how we're relating. How's the heart relating to this? What's the mind knowing how, and how is it relating? Those are the two, probably the two only relevant questions. Everything else will take care of itself what's arising in the sense of what's the sensitive heart being sensitive to right now and how is it relating? And maybe the third question is, is it relating in a skillful or unskillful way, a helpful or an un unhelpful way, just to illuminate that there are different ways to be relating right now. And is the way the mind is relating, the first impulse to relate in this way, is that going to be helpful? If it, if it intuitively doesn't seem helpful, we can refrain. 
And maybe there's another impulse to relate to the present moment that we intuit is more helpful. Because the alternative to understanding this as a natural process is, you know, the mind is some demonic trickster out to mess with us, right? I mean, that, we th sometimes think that way. Like, where did this mind come from? And I can't trust you. And, you know, just various uh, ideas, negative ideas about the mind. Or we think we're being pushed around <coughs> by impersonal forces, which, you know, both <coughs> of those views, there's some evidence for, like a demonic trickster, because some of our habits are definitely not for our own well-being. And yet there they are, that impulse to do something. And we know better, and yet we still want to do it. And just like uh, the sense of being pushed around by impersonal forces, sometimes that's what the way it seems when we're just focusing on certain things. Like, why did this happen to me? Well, some big impersonal force. Uh, force. Like, why did I get laid off? Well, it has nothing to do with me. Or why did um, I end up with these parents? Or why did I have this disease? Or, you know, whatever. And it can just feel like, what well, isn't fair? But the, the Buddha, I think, would make the point that, well, what's a useful functional attitude? And a useful functional attitude is to really hone in, like it is a natural process, but to really hone in about how to participate wisely in this. Drop by drop, the bucket gets full. You've been hearing us say, I'll read that, actually that passage from the Dhammapada, this wonderful collection of verses, if I can find it. Don't disregard unskillful thinking. Uh, don't re re disregard unskillfulness thinking. It won't come back to me. With dripping drops of water, even a water jug is filled little by little. A fool is filled with unskillfulness. Don't disregard skillfulness thinking. It won't come back to me. With dripping drops of water, even a water jug is filled Little by little, a sage is filled with merit, with skillfulness. Kind of breaks the heart open, you know, that uh, this is kind of what motivated the Buddha, just seeing everybody out there wanting to be happy, wanting to be safe, that drop by drop, the way they're relating to their experience is just, in a sense, digging the hole deeper for themselves. So the Buddha says there are these five strengths. Which five? The strength of conviction or faith, strength of persistence or energy, strength of mindfulness, awareness, strength of concentration, samadhi, strength of discernment or wisdom. These are the five strengths. Just as the river Ganges flows to the east, slopes to the east, inclines to the east, in the same way when a practitioner develops, pursues, the five strengths, they flow to unbinding, awakening, slope to unbinding, incline to unbinding. And how is it that when a practitioner develops and pursues these five strengths, they flow, slope, incline to unbinding, to awakening? He says, you develop the strength of conviction dependent on seclusion, dependent on dispassion, dependent on cessation, resulting in letting go. One develops the strength of persistence, energy, mindfulness, concentration, discernment, all five of these faculties, dependent or based on seclusion, dispassion, cessation, letting go. So let me just say something, because that's a, 
That is the way the Buddha talked about, like that was the short version of the awakening process. So we think of seclusion and we go, oh, you got to go to a retreat center like the one Common Ground has out near Prairie Farm, Wisconsin. But he's talking about the mind secluded from wrong view, from wrong understanding, right? Secluded from taking the bait of these unhelpful vortexes. We see them, but the mind knows they're just that. And the mind doesn't have to get identified. So secluded, mindful, right? So taking refuge in the awareness, oh, it's just this. The unification, the samadhi, because the mind isn't going down these off ramps into distraction, into greediness and aversiveness, then the mind becomes really stable and really sensitive. That's sort of the side effect of samadhi. And with that sensitivity comes discernment, resulting, um, let's see, discernment, this passion, cessation, resulting letting go. So this passion is just the, the beginning realization that the heart doesn't need to be attached or cling or grasp. That's what this passion is. It doesn't, it's not a rejection of life as we sometimes might think with the, how we use the English word dispassion, but it's really a cooling, like not uh, dependent or not needing anything, fully in, fully engaged, but not trying to get anything. And that leads to letting go. So the dropping away of somebody trying to get something, trying to go somewhere. It's just a dropping away. That's what cessation means. It's the mind empty of self-centered grasping. So that's how the Buddha talks about these five. And you can imagine the opposite of the five. So the opposite of faith is like living your life as we do sometimes with no direction, no aspiration, no trust in anything then we're really susceptible to somebody selling us a bill of goods, you know, like politicians saying, you know, vote for me and I'll make a utopia, no matter your political orientation, you know, just selling hope, basically. Instead of somebody illuminating how it's a natural process and how we can participate, but we have to do it. I think I mentioned earlier in the retreat this sort of teaching in Buddhism about, you know, it goes something like this. The Buddhists have done their work, now it's our turn. <laughs> you know, they can only point the way, but they can't do the work for us. And it's interesting how a lot of us, we have kind of a negative idea of skill or mastery. Like we sometimes equate somebody who's masterful is kind of tight. But when we think about actual times in our life where we've gained some mastery, some real skill, I mean, even like as a kid, when we learn to use a little potty thing, you know, it's, it's like so cool. You know, we feel uplifted or, you know, learn to walk or ride a bike or walk to school by ourselves, or whatever those sort of milestones have been in our lives, go away for the first time, away from home, and deal with our own fear. You know, kiss somebody, <laughs> or whatever, take a chance and tell somebody you like them. You know, it's sort of, uh, and so how much more so would it be, you know, using teachers from our teachings from our elders to kind of slowly, gradually, with a lot of bumps and starts, get a sense of how it all works? Oh, I know how to plant seeds that will deliver. You know, I know how to participate. 
I just have to remember to do it, to keep planting a seed. Drop by drop, the bucket gets full. Joseph Goldstein would always um, quote something from uh, Henry David Thoreau, where he just has a little riff on how amazed he is about seeds. You know, he says something like, this is a bad paraphrase, you know, there's a lot of things in life I don't trust, but give me a seed. I have a lot of faith in that seed to do wondrous things. And this is, uh, you know, how we can get with our practice. It's like so much of life is ambiguous. Should I be in this relationship with this person or should I be doing this for a living or should I go on this retreat or should I be a vegan? Is it okay? You know, it's just like, how do we ever get any actual clarity? We, j we pretend, which is just its own way of suffering, pretend we're certain, but we don't really know there isn't any real clarity except with some careful connecting with our experience, the terrain starts to get clear. You know, we, you know, we've heard it a million times, you know, hatred doesn't really work <laughs> for my well-being or anybody's well-being. I mean, we might fall into that force, that vortex, but w we get to a point eventually where we start being honest with ourselves. Uh, that didn't work. You know, that was unfortunate for myself and probably others. Same with our lust, greed storms. You know, it doesn't mean we shouldn't buy something or do something, but that kind of amazing promise that the mind can concoct, that this is going to be the end all and change my life, it starts to ring hollow, you know. Fortunately, the more we observe that that promise isn't true. It doesn't mean we don't do those things. It just means we're not expecting it to be a cause for happiness. And we start to be really vigilant with what our life is teaching us. And this is real faith. I mean, initially we borrow it. We hear something that intellectually sounds clear and logical and seems to make sense, but we don't really know. But then we start to check it out and it starts to, you know, hopefully, if it's <clears throat> going to be useful teaching, it starts to align with our experience. And we really track that, basically tracking cause and effect. That's the essence of wisdom. Wisdom understands cause and effect, how things work. And in particular, how it is suffering arises and how it is suffering ceases. So if somebody asks you, like, or you get a, you know, the final essay exam in a Buddhist course, you know, what is the essence of the Buddhist path? You know, it's this insight into the causes for suffering and the causes for release. You'll get an A+. Plus. But if we want to be happy, we have to realize it. <laughs> in our own experience, without any doubt, you know, this is the growing, the deepening, of that, you know, first it's like wanting to have faith from a self-centered point of view, which is totally okay and unavoidable, to the mind just has that faith. There's always something we can do that feeds the release of suffering and refrains from adding to suffering for ourselves and others at every moment. There's always a way to plant a positive seed every moment, right now even how we're listening to the talk, how we're relating to our body sitting. Like the seed of, of interest, which would mean not taking the different off-ramps that come. Like in the middle of a talk, I might start imagining, you know, I, I feel a little joy and inspiration and I might, that might cause a little off-ramp to I got to get on another retreat. <laughs> and then you're not, you're not there hearing the teachings and using them in real time with your experience. 
Instead, we're planting a seed for, you know, fantasy or imagination or planning or whatever that off-ramp was for you. I mean, this happens all the time. It's not easy to keep planting positive seeds because there are so many off-ramps into old habits. And those old habits aren't necessarily terribly toxic, you know, but they're just not onward leading. You know, people who end up on retreats here, you know, we have, not all, of course, but we have a lot of, you know, relatively non-toxic habit energies. Because if you just had only toxic habit energies, you would find it unbearable to be in this kind of environment for nine days. Whether you're on ho- at home or at the city center or here, you know, just that exposure to the heart and mind and the absence of distraction, you know, would be hard to bear. But we're not just interested in creating a good enough landscape for our mind and our life. We're really interested is, is there really something to do with this life that is profoundly transforming and beneficial all around, not just for ourselves. And that's how faith then naturally leads to a willingness to be steadfast, to make effort. And what are we making effort for? We're we're going to be steadfast whatever has inspired faith based on our experience. Faith in Buddhist sense arises from our own experience, that it matters how we relate. So then, and initially, you know, the effort that we persist at for periods of time is to not take the off-ramps away from what we call practice, being mindfully aware. No, not now, honey. No, not now, honey. Not this. Later, maybe, but not now. Now is this. Now is the knowing, (laughs) as Ajahn Sumedho would say. Not all these different things that our minds can concoct and then live inside of for periods of time until we get bored or frustrated with that mental concoction, proliferation, and then the mind concocts something else. Why am I thinking so much? And then we obsess about that for a while. How could I stop thinking? Why does my Buddhist practice get me to stop thinking? I, mean, I need a different teacher, a different retreat. You know, I heard about Sufi dancing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's endless. Even within the Buddhist circle, it's endless, let alone when you open the doors to everything else. And it's not like a lot of that stuff is bad. You know, everybody's, anybody who's got any wisdom has some angle, some skillful means that might be useful. But we can, as uh, people have said, we can spend a lifetime digging very shallow wells. Check this out, check that out, and nothing really happens. Because eventually, as many of you have experienced deeply, eventually the going gets tough because the practice is all about um, developing the stability, you know, this engine of awakening that knows how to handle this. And, and this turns out to be uh, really hard. It's really hard to be sensitive without wisdom because there's so much dukkha, so much, besides just on the surface level of, you know, with the injustice and the poverty and the just misuse of power. But even within our own heart and mind and body, there's just so much unpleasantness. The ancient, ancient strands of holding, you know, ancestral trauma, present life trauma. And I think it's useful in our practice not to imagine there's an end to that because then it really puts the light on, is there a way, is there a heart, a mind, a wisdom, a love that can be intimate even with this humili- this feeling of humiliation, this feeling of doubt, this feeling of despair, this feeling of ambiguity, 
you know, whatever the, for you in a given moment is the most wormy, unacceptable feeling. Is there, just to be curious, like, I don't know, can it be okay? <laughs> you know, is, is it, does the heart have the capacity to be interested even when it feels like this, even when it appears like this? And so that's really the bridge between the faith, that steadfastness, persistence of energy, to that, um, it's kind of the one thing the heart really trusts, which is that wisdom awareness. Like, Because it's, it's actually awareness, mindfulness, depends on this wisdom that understands that this reflective knowing is the sort of essential catalyst for change. So this capacity we all have, it's a natural capacity of the mind to be reflectively aware, meaning, oh, this is being known. Like right now, isn't it possible for you to recognize? You don't do it, we don't do it, but isn't it possible for us to recognize that hearing Mark talk or feeling the body sitting is being known? or having an opinion arise about whatever's going on now for you is being known. And now it's okay when we're wavering, like, well, maybe it's important, but I don't really know. So that's the word sati, mindfulness, awareness. But, but that, the effort, that steadfastness to not take the off-ramps, what it reveals is what's left is awareness, is the knowing. Because we're not taking the bait of all the other mental doings that the mind would normally do. Planning this, comparing, wondering if I got it right, do I really know what I'm doing, you know? Well, but I know that there's doubt, right? Because that's being reflectively known. Oh yeah, the mind's doubting, do I know what I'm doing? I guess I know what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, it's funny that way. It's like that capacity to be aware is always there, but we have to remember to recognize it. That's the hard part. Remembering to recognize is, is then becomes the effort. And then when that effort is really honing in, because it's easier to get interested in awareness than to put out all the fires. But when we don't have a lot of confidence and a lot of intuition about what that wisdom awareness is, then all we're doing is, all we know is, don't go there, don't go there, don't go there. It's just going to eat your heart out. You know, you're just going to end up tight. It's a promise that's not going to be capped. You know, it's just like you have that wisdom that these different habits of obsessing, thinking, planning, aren't going to deliver anything, but that's all we know. But as we practice more and more and get good teachings, then we start to have some confidence, and then the effort is directed more specifically toward awareness, and that's what builds the samadhi. It's the continuity of awareness that builds that beautiful... It's really, in my book, the only beautiful thing in the world, samadhi. And when you think about a lot of the beautiful art and uh, performance and leadership and activism and just tremendous acts of service, like when you see a, a parent just being a good parent, a lot of it is just what we're really appreciating. It is that heart and mind being in that moment that we're observing all in. You know, there's not like, the mind fighting against itself or it's just like submitting and showing up and being all in and that's what we're developing in meditation too it's just in this more inner sense but we want to do it in the outer sense too of course and you might have noticed that you know when tim and cam were sawing down the limbs of the trees so we could expand the parking lot you know just like were they all in or were they not? You know, or when you were cleaning the bathrooms, those of you who did the bathrooms, or those of you who cooked or cleaned up after meals, or 
clean the entranceways or managed the retreat or managed the kitchen or gave the talks, you know, were we all in? Divided or not divided? Fragmented or unfragmented? Whole or divided? And that's what we're really learning. And, and here, specifically with our practice, it's being wholly present, unwaveringly present. So that continuity of mindfulness, continuity of wisdom and awareness, then blooms into this beautiful flower of samadhi. And the thing about samadhi, it's, it's like the, the pleasure of being present. You know that, I think I might've read that quote from Sharon a couple of nights ago. Great fullness of being, which we experience as happiness, can also be described as love. To be undivided and unfragmented, to be completely present is to love. To pay attention is to love. And for me, that, that's not a bad definition of samadhi because that wholeness, that completeness, that undivided quality, and especially revolving around that stable presence. It, uh, I think I mentioned the other night, it has both the flavor of samadhi and metta, loving kindness and presence. It's like a coming together. There's really no stable present moment awareness and ill will. I mean, that stable present moment awareness can be aware of ill will, but it's aware of ill will with kindness, not with ill will. And you'll see that, you know, you'll notice sometimes you're really frustrated and then you can just check. But is the knowing of the frustration frustrated? No, the, the knowing of the frustration when the practice has some momentum isn't frustrated. It's, there's a wholeness. We're not throwing the frustration out of our heart. We're meeting it and we're connecting with it. We're aware of it. Oh, honey. Frustration's like this, feels like this. Humiliation feels like this. Confusion is like this. This is real development and practice. And in a way, we're letting the world around us prod and poke and provoke these, let's call them ugly qualities, so we can realize that awareness can see and feel and know without having a problem being a bad meditator or having a problem, you know, with whatever the particular moment looks and feels like. Because that's real freedom, not to have to be special. I mean, talk about a hell realm, like, oh, I got to be mindful. You know, I got to be wise and kind. I got to move slowly <laughs> or, you know, whatever we imagine that being awakened looks like. I mean, that would be, you know, to kind of, kind of pull off that act all life long. And then what people do, of course, is they try that and then they, it leaks, you know, they hit their cat or their, <laughs> you know, somewhere they can't kind of hold it together anymore because it's like a rubber band, you stretch it this way, what's going to swing you back the other way? So it can't be some contrivance. And that, you know, blooms into wisdom, seeing things clearly, seeing how to align. So instead of conceiving of myself as being a part, trying to get back to the middle, Wisdom understands things wholly, nothing outside. So even our most neurotic uh, activity of our heart and mind, you know, it's uh, amazingly not a problem. It's not self. It's arising 
lawfully, conditionally, because of causes and conditions. It's like this sometimes. Yeah. And so like each of us uniquely have to completely accept our situation, our conditioning, our beauty and our horror, you know, depending on our personalities. That's our sort of unique path for awakening. It's like not having a problem being me with this kind of body and mind and this sort of life situation as trapped as I might feel or whatever. To be all in, but not take it personally. To let nature be nature. Oh, I get Mark. I guess Mark gets to be Mark. Not that I want Mark to be Mark, but there's no other way except to let Mark be Mark. And everybody else the same. So this is something to bring up, you know, every once in a, a while, you know, just to see that, yeah, whether I realize it or not, I'm working on faith. You know, and it may be frantic at times. I'm working on being steadfast and I'm working on my valuing and recognizing of awareness. And I'm really learning to appreciate that beautiful blossoming of samadhi and what might be in the way as the one kind of healing beauty we actually get to enjoy. You know, because it's, it's, it's in a worldly sense, it's the most stable pleasure that's available, even though it's not, you can't get it on demand, no matter how much money you have. And then how it blossoms to wisdom and they just feed on each other. Wisdom supports faith. Without wisdom, faith becomes, you know, like strident because we hope what I think is true <laughs> instead of knowing it's true and knowing it isn't personal that it's true. It's not my wisdom, right? And it's just like seeing that the engine has its own, it knows what it's doing. It's so nice to trust the Dharma, to trust our interest in the Dharma, to not be less concerned with what's in the way, but more how it's building momentum, my interest, the quality of my intentions, the yucky feeling of being disconnected, like, oh, I miss my practice, right? You just see how, oh, that engine's starting to come alive. It's having its own life. May it be so. Mm -hmm. So let's take a moment, let go of the words. Thanks for your kind attention. <laughs>